Patrol Director of uh, Tucson Medical Center, is that right? That's correct, yep. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of Mindy Hart, um, this is Manafa Safin, and today uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you all for a very special uh, Monty Hart. We have Dr. Thomas Wagoner uh, here with us, who is the uh, Director of Structural Heart at Tucson Medical Center in Arizona. And um, he'll be speaking with us today about his um, experience with the uh, High Life TMVR system. So uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Wagoner, and um, please go ahead. Excellent, it's an honor and privilege to be here this morning. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, discuss this great case with uh, you, Dr. Asafin and Dr. Latib. So very good. So I'm Dr. Wagner, again, Director of Structural Heart and Director of Cardiovascular Research and the Fellowships at Tucson Medical Center, Pima Heart and Vascular in Tucson, Arizona. So let's get started. These are my disclosures, none relevant to today's talk. Tucson Medical Center, I'll give you a little background. People sometimes are unaware that uh, outside of Phoenix, there is another city that uh, has over a million people, about a million and a half, it's in Tucson, Arizona. We have a very, very large retirement community down there. And uh, we have the largest cardiovascular practice in the state of Arizona called Pima Heart and Vascular, uh, now called U.S. Heart and Vascular. Uh, Tucson Medical Center is actually voted one of the best hospitals in the region here by uh, U.S. News and World Report for two years running now, 2021, 2022, and then now 2022 into 2023. So very proud of that. A lot of it's really focused on our structural heart and our research uh, programs that have been developed over the last few years. We're at about 30 clinical trials in the hospital uh, and about 35 clinical trials outside the hospital uh, in the, our private practice. So these are some of the uh, high volume structural heart trials we're in. You can see Align AR, which is uh, for pure AI, we're the only site in Arizona. Champion F, we finished number two globally. Uh, Noble Stitch, a PFO device, uh, number one currently for US enrollments. A protected Tabor using Sentinel CPS device, number two in US enrollments. Uh, Restore F and Appella trial, uh, highest PCI trial number two in the U.S. Uh, in the bottom left there, Laminar, an LA closure device, uh, finished uh, number two in their EFS in their first 15 patients. Uh, Millipede, we were the first implant uh, with an existing watchman. I know uh, Dr. Latib, I think, did the first one, actually, or one of the first ones in the U.S. with that device. And then finally, uh, what we're going to talk about today and focus on is High Life, a, a novel transeptal TMBR system that we'll spend some time talking about uh, this new device and sharing one of our earlier cases. So very good. Without further ado, this is the case of myself, Dr. Wired, and my partner, Dr. Bill Thomas, uh, High Life, January 19th, 2023. This is the valve. What I like about the valve is it has this nice atrial hat you can see on top of it that really sits and helps prevent perivalvular leak and helps anchor the valve on the atrial side. So we'll talk a little bit more about this particular uh, feature of this valve, but I think this is really important to understand as we move forward. We know Edge to Edge is currently FDA approved with two devices. It does work in DMR. We're using it in FMR in trials as well as commercially uh, with MitroClip. However, when you have really degenerative leaflets and there's protein elastic breakdown, when you clip a specific scallop, you can sometimes create extra leaflet stressors on the adjacent scallops. For example, if you have a P2 prolapse in an 85 year old, right? And you clip P2 to A2, get a great result acutely, if you have mild P1 and mild P3 prolapse at the time, we have seen earlier breakdown, we believe, in those adjacent scalps as you create this flagpole effect. When you have one side tethered, the remainder of the leaflet is free to, to blow in the wind, if you will. And I think when you have higher afterload, that can prematurely or accelerate DMR, particularly in an older cohort. So we have really leaned toward valve replacement strategies uh, for DMR if they're over the age of 80, 85. So this is the valve. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit more. It's a 28 millimeter porcelain valve. You have two components to it. One is the delivery system of this sub ring. And then the second one is putting the valve transeptally. So it's a valve and, a valve and ring concept. Uh, 18 French arterial, 26 French venous, and then a 30 French valve capsule uh, through the transeptal. This is our team. We did uh, the, the valve again January 19th. I'm super proud of our team here in Tucson. They've done a lot of early feasibility devices and have done a great job with that. So. So this is, I'll show you a brief, just procedural animation to kind of lay the foundational groundwork of what we actually did. This kind of de just delineates the steps that are involved in this procedure. So I'll, sh I'll show a short animation, if you will, and I'll kind of just narrate through this. So here's the valve again, porcine 20 millimeter valve. As you know, most TMVR systems and even tricuspid systems are, has a 28 millimeter uh, ID. 
So uh, trans arterial, 18 French, usually on the left groin, and then the right side will have our 26 uh, transvenous axis. So we're coming through retroaortic through the valve. And what we do is we ensnare the cords just below the valve. Usually you can use an 035 glide wire uh, type of device that will encircle the cords, and then you snare the cords. This animation is actually showing the snaring in the LV. We actually prefer to snare in the aorta. So wire out through the aorta once we ensnare the cords, we'll create a loop with our snare and pull our system back, retract into the descending order. Then bring in this loop delivery system, place this ring, which has a nitinol locking mechanism, locks in place. That was the long axis view of this same, same maneuver. So we're retroaortic, going around the base of the valve on the ventricular side, snaring the cords, creating a loop, retracting that loop into the ACE aorta, and then we'll advance our loop delivery system. So first you have to get the cords, bring the loop delivery system in, drop your loop, and then we go do our transeptal procedure with the valve. Now if you watch here, we're coming transeptal, very typical valve and ring approach or valve and valve approach, if you will, if you're doing Edwards on label. 30 French capsule with the valve. We go to the outflow first, withdraw the device, create tension, ensure the ring's in the right spot, then open up the atrial hat or the inflow. The actual deployment of the valve takes about 30 seconds once you're in position. The hardest part, as you can imagine, would be trying to you know, ensnare the cords, if you will. So that's a nice animation, and I'll walk through the steps procedurally that we did in our case. But again, the atrial hat, I think, is a feature that we'll focus on in terms of PBL reduction, which still remains an issue today with most uh, current devices in the space that are in clinical trials. Excellent, here we go. So the three major steps, loop placement, ring delivery, and then valve delivery. So number one, two, and three, those are the three major procedural steps. The loop placement is the hardest because you have to snare those cords. And sometimes you, you, you kind of learn under fluoro and under T that uh, it's not as easy as it looks in certain anatomies. Our first case actually went very smooth. I think it only took us 15 to 20 minutes to snare those cords. That second case took a little bit longer because there can be what's called traps where you have trabeculations or indentations in the area at the Bowser segment of the heart. Then you do ring delivery, you lock your ring in place, and then you deploy your valve transeptally. So let's go through our case, 82 year old male, STS of 4.2% had a prior sternotomy with prior cabbage, multivessel disease, his grafts were open and stable, including a patent lima. Uh, NYHA class three, he had three to four plus DMR, his ROA was 0 0.5, and his regression volume was 72 mLs, and the heart team said, uh, this guy needs a valve, and transcatheter would be the way to go if we can. I'll show you the leaflets here in a minute. So here's the procedural steps. Again, we're gonna do our, our loop delivery. Retroaortic, it's an 18 French transarterial catheter. And essentially you have uh, two inner tubes inside the catheter. One is the snare and one is the 035 glide wire, which is essentially in like a glide cap, a soft angle glide cap. Use that to navigate around the cords and capture the cords, create a full loop. And again, we try to snare in the aorta, ascending aorta or proximal descending aorta if you can. Our animation did show in the LV. If you look on the upper right image, you can see the T we're coming retroaortic. Usually this system will sit in the non or right coronary cusp. So you do want to watch for AI at baseline and monitor that throughout the course. Uh, during our cases, we had uh, no leaflet injury, the aortic valve and uh, only mild AI at baseline, which is unchanged. So we go to our one chamber view. If you look on the uh, left image there on fluoroscopy. We're trying to orientate ourselves in a long axis. So this is LEO caudal. Um, again, left and right on the bottom image there. You are coordinating that with your CT baseline measurements to get your views, your baseline one, two, three, and four chamber views. And then you correlate that with your TE to ensure you're ensnaring all the cords and not missing any cords. The last thing you want to do is go behind a cord uh, rather in front of a cord and have a space behind the cord and then pull that cord in. You'll have a, a an issue with the paragraph leak potentially later on. So we're ensnaring our cords in the one chamber view. We confirm then in a two chamber 
three chamber and four chamber view on fluoro as well as on TE. And TE here is really helpful. 3D TE uh, can be very helpful. Even 2D X plane mode through uh, your bicomestrial view. Which now, if you begin to look on the image on the right side, you can appreciate the aortic valve and you see an echo uh, lucent line. That's the 035 glide wire in our hypo tube, which essentially is like a soft angle glide wire. You can appreciate that coming just infra annular, just below the valve ensuring we snare the cords as proximal to the valve as possible. So then once we do that, then we do our, uh, essentially our snaring again, which is usually done in, in the ACN aorta. This is our, our loop placement catheter. The LPC is, is positioned ACN aorta and we bring our a snare up. You can see here, we're snaring that just for the standard uh, 27 millimeter goose neck snare comes with the system. Once you create your loop, then you can bring your ring, dis, your ring delivery system in place. However, before you do that, we go to our transeptal. So once we have ensnared our cords, we go to our transeptal prior to bringing the loop delivery system in. Generally, you wanna be mid-mid, uh, more posterior is the better. If you can uh, have the opportunity on the intraatrial septum, do our standard transeptal technique. We use an acuitous or uh, Acucross Mini, works very well, you can use your standard equipment. We keep that positioned in the left atrium, again with four ACTs, 250 or greater. Then we go back and do our loop. We go back to our loop delivery system and place our, our ring, our subannual ring, or SAI. So here it is here. And then uh, once we have our SAI, which is that subannular implant in place, you can see the image on fluoroscopy. We're bringing that, uh, our ring essentially over the 035 glide wire creating an interlocking mechanism in the ring, which you can appreciate. And once you oversheath it, you create a lock in that ring. So the SAR sub inner implant is our ring that's gonna create the anchor for our valve. Once this is in place then, the rest of it's the easy part, it's deploying the valve. So again, transeptal uh, is already in place. We have a uh, double curve Lunderquist. We've tried other wires like a, a small curve or extra small safari the valve will kind of prolapse up into the left atrium. So we have found that the double curve Lundy is probably the best wire for this gives you the most body, most support. Here we are here, our SAI is being placed, which is a sub ring. It's really neat, you actually, when you lock it, it crumples up. So you know you have the ring secured by this locking mechanism, it'll actually fold up and crumple. And that's what you wanna see under fluoroscopy. It's a pretty good uh, push and pull technique to ensure that ring is locked the 18 French system. So there's the ring. We have our transeptal already secured. And here's the valve. Again, double curve Lundy, good support. The catheter is not steerable. It's not an articulating catheter, it just tracks over the wire, which is fine. It worked out very well with the wire. Again, we've tried it with, with Safari, uh, as well as the double curve Lundy, and the, and the body of the double curve Lundy definitely uh, facilitated an easier, an easier uh, transition at this point right here in the left atrium to the transeptal. And then once you're in place with this, the rest of it's pretty easy. The, again, the valve deployments, it's just a simple rotation on your catheter, um, with your operator, your second operator. The first operator, the primary operator is holding tension. So once we are in this position, okay, we confirm with echo to make sure that they can see the outflow. We open up the, the capsule, the outflow of the valve. Once that valve is opened, we pull it up and abut it as, as tight as you can to, to the ring. And it's definitely a point where they say you, you want to feel uncomfortable with the pullback. What you don't want to do is deploy that ring or deploy the valve below the ring or part of it below the ring, right? Then you'll have issues with the valve stability, potential embolization. So in this position, we're opening up the capsule, which is the outflow. Once we open up the outflow, we pull back. And then within 30 seconds, the valve is deployed. I think we have that capture on the next slide. So here we are here, we're in position. You can see our hands, we're counterclock, we're rotating, opening up the outflow of the valve, we're looking on echo, we're confirming we have contacts, or we're, we're talking very directly with our, our anesthesiologist and our echo text guy and saying, guys, we see contact, make sure we have contact. Four points of contact, not just on a single side. Once we have contact, we pull back, open up the outflow, pull back further, open up the inflow and the valve's deployed. And it 
takes off about uh, you know, 30 seconds. So here we go. It's already deployed in the image on the left. You can see the valve with the atrial hat and the ring. And it's beautifully positioned here. And what you have is that ring just immediately below the annulus, pulling in the cords, and you have your valve inside of it. Okay. And that valve has the atrial hats. So you have two forces. You have the waist, the ring, left ventricular cardiac output is going to push the ring atrial. The atrial hat prevents it from PVL, uh, like a PVL guard, if you will, on the atrial side. So it's a really unique device. I think uh, what I like about the, the new iteration, the high flow clarity, is the uh, ability to have open cells in the LVOT. So you can worry less about new LVOT. Uh, we did do an alcohol uh, modification, alcohol subtablation modification of our, our second case to have the valve fit. But beautiful result, very happy with it. You can see the image on the Flexi Light and Flexi Slice on the right side. PVL, I think, is one of the Achilles heels with a lot of Team VR systems in contemporary uh, clinical trials. And I think this is uh, this will be uh, an industry changer potentially. So the total uh, procedural time you can see 111 minutes. I think the actual valve deployment takes about 30 seconds. A lot of it is just securing the subvalvular apparatus to ensure that you're behind the cords in the correct location. You're avoiding traps and um, getting your uh, subannular implant in place, which is that ring. So here is a 3D iteration, so uh, rendition rather, of our baseline TE. And I should have showed this up front, but I want you guys just to appreciate the valve before we looked at this. So a little bit grainy, it gains up a little bit hub. You can appreciate just a multi-leaflet degeneration in this valve. And so we clip these, uh, you know, many times. And what happens is, is they get adjacent eccentric MR jets. Here is the color flow baseline and then we're going to jump to a couple other images here of the valve implant but flagpole effect I think is a real concept and that is where when you clip a DMR leaflet you have to be very conscientious about the adjacent scallops leaflet integrity particularly DMR FMR different story based on the co-op data you clip edge to edge repair with leaflet tissue that is healthy and that's another story. With degenerative MR, I think it's really, really important to appreciate the adjacent scalps, not just the index pathology using mitral tear, but the adjacent scalp leaflet integrity uh, in the short and long term. Here's our uh, valve deployment, uh, the final result. You can see the image on the top left, which is the fluoroscopy, and then the image on the top right, which is the uh, 3D on phosphate uh, immediately uh, intra-op post-procedure. Hemodynamics remain great. You don't have to rapid pace. There's no hemodynamic embarrassment or compromise. Um, I think that's a, a nice uh, feature as well. So we're going to take a little zoomed in picture of this valve. Go to the next slide. Here we go. So this is a, a, a dedicated image looking on FOSS, top down, left atrial appendage is at uh, 10 o'clock, uh, intraatrial septum is at 3 o'clock, aortic valve is at 12 o'clock, and you can see uh, looking down on this atrial skirt which really just encompasses the entire uh, valve aimless. And I think, again, PVL will be nil. Both cases we've done, uh, we had zero PVL. And I think we have some color here. Yeah, so color. No significant perivalve relief at all. Again, hemodynamics remain rock solid, uh, no rapid pacing, no hemodynamic compromise. And then we closed up single proglide in the A and uh, double proglide in the B. So that was it, guys. It was a great case and uh, really excited. I want to give a, a thank you and shout out to Dr. Latif. Appreciate the opportunity to present here as well as Dr. Manoff. And a special thanks to Judy Jensen and the Phenomenal High Life team. They've been instrumental helping get these slides together. So thank you very much, guys. That's the case we had at Tucson Medical Center in January 19, 2023. I'll take any questions. That was fantastic, Dr. Wagner. Thank you, and congratulations on uh, um, a really uh, great case, and I think a phenomenal result for your patient. Um, before um, we turn it over to the fellows who um, have some questions for you, um, I just wanted to uh, ask myself a few questions and a few comments. So, um, you know, going back to the valve design, I think you touched on. Um, this kind of very elegant, clever design that involves um, this two-piece system that really addresses a lot of the issues that we have with, um, with transcatheter valve replacement um, in the mitral. Uh, and um, 
um, includes things like we, we recently had uh, were involved in this registry called the decline TMVR registry. And we looked at um, the most common reasons that people screen out for these um, uh, transcatheter mitral valve uh, procedures. And you know the two big things that kept coming up was was sizing, um, people's valves being um, uh, too large uh, for the available devices and LVOT obstruction. I think this uh, valve uh, addresses those two um, common reasons that patients screen fail, which is an important thing that we have to look at if we're going to, you know, make transcatheter mitral valve replacement um, um, a real uh, option going forward. And I think um, the ring and um, uh, and the uh, the open cells of the new clarity valve um, address those two things uh, kind of respectively. Um, but just to uh, clarify for uh, for myself, having the open cells uh, at the um, at the uh, outflow of the valve um, that doesn't preclude, for example, the need to do to cut a mitral leaflet if you had a long anterior mitral leaflet. Um, is that right? Would you still need to allow those cells to be exposed by 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 doing uh, a lampoon in in some cases? And exactly, you know, great question. You, you still may need to uh, do either alcohol subtablation, septal modification, or leaflet modification. Uh, we're still learning that. You know, we're very early, obviously, in the trial, still in early feasibility. But uh, I can say that uh, the cases we've done, just a simple septablation, if it's over 15 millimeters of septum, is enough to, to uh, avoid any leaflet modification. But I think either or, be, being prepared, understanding your anatomy uh, and, and doing a, a septablation or Lethal modification is would be totally appropriate. Now, I will say with what well, going back to your first comment, there are, would be a third thing I would add. So the, the first one, as you said, is valve size. The second is neo VOT, the small neo VOT. The third one then is calcium, right? So MAC, I think, is uh, is the third Achilles heel of the TMVR space. Uh, it remains true. So most valves uh, have a hard time treating that, which makes sense. If you have a substrate uh, of a leaflet that is the issue, however, the frame of the door, I love the door analogy, right? Door and frame. So the analyst is the frame, the door of the leaflets. So if it's a leaflet problem, a primarily a leaflet problem, valve replacements or tear works. If it's primarily a frame or angular problem, then you're looking at valve replacement strategies. With that though, uh, if the door is off the hinges and the frame is, is jammed, then that's an additional problem. So that's where the calcium comes in. So I think we're still trying to understand which valve system is going to work and how do we approach MAC with MR or MAC in general. Um, which would be the, the probably the coup de grace. It's the most challenging, I think, of the space. But in terms of valve sizing and neo-VOT and PVL reduction, that's what I really like about this valve with the atrial hat. Right. As, we move, as we move forward in this space, it's going to be really important to understand, you know, those three, I would say four, including PVL, because usually that implies MAC, how to approach those, each anatomy, how we understand and, and write the narrative for a new valve replacement in the setting of one or all four of those complexities to TMBR. And that's why, you know, Taver has been approved in the U.S. over a decade. It's been around for 20 years. And, and yet mitral is, is probably going to slip behind tricuspid. We'll probably have a tricuspid valve on the market before we'll have a, a mitral, uh, yeah, that's right. you know, transcatheter valve on the market. So, but great, great points and, and great questions. Yeah, thanks. Congratulations again. And um, uh, a special shout out to your imager. I mean, those were really amazing um, TEE um, pictures that you're able to show us. So uh, I think it's uh, uh, so important to have uh, good imaging to guide cases like this. Um, I wanted to ask uh, you having done two cases, um, what would you say is the kind of primary driver uh, of the procedure? Is it, is it mostly echo that you're looking at? Um, is there a lot of involvement on fluoroscopy or is it equally both? What would you say? Yeah, I would say it's a, that's another great question. It's equally both. Um, you know, I think as, as structurists, we're always looking at imaging with T, particularly mitral and tricuspid. Uh, however, uh, you kind of relearn your fluoroscopic views, meaning you know a one chamber view, two right. chamber view, three chamber view, and four chamber view on fluoro, which we hit, you know traditionally don't use. But being pragmatic, this was something that we have to go back and, and kind of relearn and reteach ourselves. So understanding uh, one, two, three, and four chamber views on flora, which is, it's it's simple. It, it's it's not complex, but just re, kind of refreshing that uh, based on your CT imaging. So your, your TMVR CTA will help give you those four chambers and then you correlate those on TE 
and then fluoroscopy. And we'll actually write out, you know, each view, you know, one chamber view, LAO caudal, two chamber view, LAO crany, et cetera. And we'll have them on our whiteboard during the procedure. So we'll know those exact angles to go to, to get those views and understanding which direction you're going to try to wire to get to and around each cord. And that's the purpose of that, to understanding uh, that you're, you ensure that you're not going to miss a cord when you do your snare. Yeah, that's really great. We've also been using a little bit more of the um, uh, fusion uh, imaging with uh, uh, echo um, uh, and fluoro um, um, uh, guidance and overlay. So that's uh, that's been really um, uh, helpful, and I think will be a game changer in, with procedures like this. Excellent. Um, uh, so open it up to the fellows for any questions. Um, Guys, uh, you have the, the floor. Anybody um, have any questions for Dr. Wagner? I have a question. Um, thank you, thank you, Dr. Wagner. This is um, God is speaking, one of the interventional fellow. I, um, my question is, uh, it was a great presentation, an excellent outcome on, on this case. By the way, um, how does severely dilated um, left atrial? enlargement as well as mag affect this um, valve system and how do you um, counteract or, or react um, to this to have to to, to have a, a, like an excellent outcome that's a great question so i'll reiterate so left atrial enlargement severe left atrial enlargement it really is not an issue as long as the annulus is, is less than 45 millimeters um, i think that right now with the current valve iterations in efs so the atrial size is actually being large is not a bad thing we like uh, we like space to move around so with most uh, transcatheter systems, we, we do not like small atriums, and generally you shouldn't unless it's very acute MR. Uh, you'll have atrial modeling, and you want to expect to have some atrial dilatation. So a large LA is not a problem. Uh, you know, we prefer to have that than the opposite. Uh, so if you have a small LA, then there's risk of obviously having interaction with the atrial wall, potential complications. Great question. Thank you so and much, Dr. Wagner. Uh, I have a, a question. Uh, uh, what is the risk of any damage to the cords? And uh, uh, the the can you control the cinching of, of the device or the ring? Can you uh, if if that's uh, something? How how we, how we decide on the how how uh, tense the ring can be? Yeah, great question. So the question is, can you damage the the cords and can you control the cinching? So yes and yes. Um, the damage to the cords, though, is is very, very minimal. I'd say almost nil if you are uh, keenly aware of your views. Again, the, the fluoroscopic one through four chamber views as well as TE, you're, you're kind of toggling back and forth between the two of those and even using imaging overlay, as Manoff was suggesting, be a great, uh, would be an additive uh, solution to that. But really just being diligent, like any transcapital procedure, you, you are understanding your anatomy, whether it's a coronary, a tricuspid, or a mitral, or an aortic, you're understanding your anatomy in each cusp and each leaflet in each core. And I think imaging is key to that, having good high quality imaging, uh, both fluoroscopically and uh, TE, you can avoid that. So I think there is a risk to injuring the cord, but I think it's very, very low. We've not seen it. In terms of controlling the cinching, uh, there's a certain amount of pressure force that you can put on when you're cinching up the device, but you can also appreciate on, on a fluoroscopy. When you, when you are cinching, your catheter will get pulled in across the valve, which you want to avoid. So when you see your catheter diving, it's an 18 French arterial catheter, you know you're cinching, you're pulling too much, putting too much tension on it. So I think that can easily be avoided just with uh, you know observing your guide position. You wanna keep it just above uh, the valve if possible. Thank you. Great question. Matteo. Hi, good morning, Dr. Wagner. Uh, thank you for really a great presentation. Uh, I think this device is, is super cool and uh, something to look forward to in the future, but um, a quick question. I know the uh, the planning process maybe is a bit more complicated than others because you have to go through these uh, different fluoroscopic projections as well uh, and take into consideration maybe the subvalvular components um, a little bit more. Uh, do you think this adds another component to screen failure for these patients? Um, I think, you know, most TMVR trials have a high rate of screen fail for the various four reasons we just mentioned. I don't think this uh, would adds any more to it. I think it actually adds a higher level of understanding your anatomy. Um, one thing you do want to be cognizant of are what we call traps, where there's an indentation or a trabeculation, which are generally at the apex of the ventricle that can be prominent in some folks up region, 
or you have a deep trabeculation, you want to avoid getting a wire stuck in there because it can be hard to navigate it around using, you know, your, your hypo tube. So I think um, it actually helps understand your, your anatomy better. Um, and the pre-procedural planning with Nico and his team at High Life Board was uh, exceptional both times. And I really uh, valued his input, the proctor, um, tremendously. And I think it was very helpful understanding watchouts like uh, ventricular trabeculations of traps, as well as multi or secondary and tertiary cords. Um, Julio? Uh, good morning, Dr. Warner. Thank you for, for this wonderful talk. I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, do you have any special consideration in patients uh, with aortic stenosis or aortic vegetation during the uh, guide wire looping? And the second one is in those patients with high risk of acute astrolabal mismatch with low ejection fraction, what is your general approach in your clinical daily practice? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, in terms of uh, stenosis, uh, this the valve is only approved for, or the valve is being studied in regurgitation, but I think going forward, there is a chance that we could use this valve for stenosis. Um, you may, you know, potentially do a valvuloplasty prior to, to set that uh, stage for a good ring anchor deployment. Uh, but I think it has some future role for that. Right now, it's just in DMR. I'm sorry, I missed the second part of the question. Could you repeat that? The second part is, yes, of course. The second part is in patients uh, with low age and fraction that uh, there is a risk always of acute after love mismatch. What is your general approach in this patient, your the preconditioning of these patients before TMBR? Gotcha. So low EF, uh, risk of afterload, uh, changing afterload and low EF. Yeah, so... In general, as you know, when you put a, a mitral valve replacement in someone who has an EF of the, beyond 20%, we kind of avoid those situations. So on average, the EF will historically drop about seven points or 7%, if you will, um, seven to 10% actually um, due to changing afterload. This valve, we the cases we've done it have both been with preserved EF, so we've not seen that issue. My general approach is if it's an edge-to-edge -edge system, I will allow a pop-off. Uh, I think that is appropriate, uh, particularly if it's less than 25%. So I think having uh, an acute change in afterload can have issues with myocardial contractility, short and long term. I think data does support that. So you want to be cognizant of someone with an EF less than 20 to 25 when you're doing a full valve replacement. And most trials will have a cutoff of an EF of less than 25% as a screen fail uh, in their early screening process for most uh, TNVR systems because of that reason. Great question. Yeah, um, Andrea. Hi, Dr. Wagner. Thank you very much for this talk. Life is a very interesting device. I was, as Julio, I was interested in how you um, select patients for all these trials because you are involved in several trials and there are different valves. So um, my question is for patients, <clears throat> who have mitral regurgitation, either secondary or primary, um, how do you decide to screen them for a TMVR device? Uh, do they have to be ineligible for tier, or there are some patients who you prefer TMVR as a first choice? Great question. So uh, we are privileged to be in multiple uh, mitral trials, and I think that's uh, unique to many centers, uh, big centers at least. But what I do like about having is additional tools in your toolbox, right? The mitral valve is so complex. Again, it's a, a decade behind aortics and, and uh, you know, it's gonna be behind tricuspid very soon in terms of replacement strategies. So there's usually never one right tool because of the complexity of the valvular substrate that's present with DMR and even FMR. So um, I look at three things. Again, neo-LVOT, neo-LVOT, and neo-LVOT. Those are the first three things. The second one is degree of calcium. So I'm always looking at, can I put a valve in? Is there a risk of overcrowding? So that's number one, two, and three. So when I say neo-VOT, I mean all the substrate around the valve. So it's not just the outflow tract. Is there a risk of overcrowding? Valvular, subvalvular, or LVOT? Then I look at calcium. Where's the burden of calcium? Can I sit a valve and implant a valve and not have, have a risk of PVL or injury with calcium? So I look at MAC, just like I look at calcified LVOTs when I'm doing a TAVR. So the burden of calcium, is it a, is it a bicuspid valve for going to aortics real quick? You know, what are the features you look at aortics? STJ height, right, for future valve and valve coronary axis, LVOT calcium, and bicuspids are, are some simple variables with calcium distribution. So the same thing with mitrals. 
Is it anterior calcium? Is it posterior calcium? Is it an arc of 270 or 360 degrees of calcium? Am I thinking valve and MAC trial? Am I thinking valve and dock system? Am I thinking, you know, small atrium, small needle VOT? Is edge to edge a possibility? So I think understanding your anatomy, going through an algorithm of LVOT issues, sizing, overcrowding, MAC, atrial sizing, and then FMR, DMR. I think that's a simple algorithm we use to determine which device we're going to put in. And there's no right answer to it, right? As, as you know, we're still learning in this space. There's there's nothing on label for replacements, and that's what's you know that's what's special about mitrals, right? There again, there'll be a tricuspid valve on the market before there'll be a mitral valve. Uh, so I think uh, you know that that's the uh, still you know it's so funny mitrals. You know, we everybody jumped on tier and edge to edge the last you know since 2015. It was FDA approved on label last eight years, and now we're realizing it's not edge to edge is not the right therapy for all mitrals. And so we kind of have to take a step back and we have in the space and now we're trying to play catch up with valve replacement strategies where again, a works, we're moving on to, you know, fifth and sixth valve iterations and AI and tricuspids are going to be on label and, and mitral replacements still, you know, a decade behind everybody else because of the complexity. And I think we, we got complacent with edge to edge, which works. It's, you know, we have the data for it. It, it works Everest two co-ops, et cetera, but I think we can do better with the mitral interventions. I think valve replacement strategies are, are finally, beginning to match uh, the science uh, with the clinical need. Also, the access was a major problem for all these devices before transepical. Now we're moving to transfemoral. Do you think the double access for this valve will be a limitation or, or not compared to the other valves? I don't think so. I would take a, a, a percutaneous double access over a transepical any day. And I think most centers will. I, th I don't think we're going to have a, a device on label commercially that's going to be transapical, that's going to be uh, have any meaningful impact in, in, in our space. I think if there's just too much complexity, complexities, unless you're doing, you know, multiple transapicals a week, um, I, a double access percutaneously over a transapical, I, I think would be uh, much favored. Agreed. Um, Thomas, again, thank you very much for a um, super insightful um, presentation. Uh, congratulations again on, on your two cases. Um, uh, keep doing what you're doing over there in Tucson uh, and uh, putting it on the uh, on the map. And uh, and we hope to uh, run into you in uh, in Phoenix uh, in, yep. in July for T for TBT. Um, again, congratulations to you and your team. And um, thanks for taking the time to speak with us this morning. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate it for Monty Hart and Monty Fewer guys. Thank you very much, you and uh, Dr. Latib. Uh, you know, I know he's uh, out of the country doing a, doing a case. It sounds like he said he messaged at 2.40 this morning. I'm like, great for him. So you guys have done a tremendous job there. And, and uh, uh, kudos to you guys. Congratulations as well, uh, Manoff and, and Azim and the whole team there. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And you guys have a great day. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.